Um, but first up, I'm delighted that uh, uh, our next speaker is able to join us. Welcome, Florian. Dr. Florian Osman is Head of AI Governance and Regulatory Innovation at the Alan Turing Institute, which is the UK's National Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence. His areas of expertise include regulation and non-regulatory governance mechanisms for AI, as well as the use of AI to facilitate the work of regulatory bodies. So a warm welcome from the open group, please, for Dr. Florian Osman. Thank welcome. you very much. Thank you. That's just a, a sticker. Yeah, right back. here. Perfect. Thank you very much, Steve, and a good afternoon, everyone. Uh, oh, sorry, one more thing, Florian. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. A reminder, questions, slido.com, meeting, uh, meeting name is OGEDI, and we'll ask the questions in the panel. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone, um, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so what I will try to do in the next uh, 30 to 40 minutes is to uh, give you a bit of an overview of the AI governance landscape uh, sort of key developments, um, both in regulatory terms, so evolving regulation for AI, and then uh, as a second step, uh, focus on the role of standards. Uh, because standards and standardization, especially at the international level, is a common theme that's emerging very strongly in regulatory uh, contexts um, in different jurisdictions. And so, of course, very topical uh, to uh, an organization like yours. Um, I hope it'll be interesting to dive deeper into, into the role of standards towards the end. Now, I should start by saying there's a lot, obviously, AI regulation, AI policy developments is a vast, has become a really you know, vast field over the last few years. And um, it would be too much and overwhelming if I tried to cover sort of you know, developments from around the world and in every, every jurisdiction. So what I've decided to do is to focus on two jurisdictions, um, which, um, for various reasons I think are interesting to consider and particularly, um, well the first one is obviously particularly prominent. So the first one will be the European Union and the uh, EU AI Act as a piece of regulation, which is sort of, a, a, you know, in many ways the, the most advanced uh, piece of regulatory policy making in the world. Um, and then as a second example, um, the UK government's approach to AI policy and AI regulation. Um, in part because it contrasts in, in many, in, in several ways, in interesting ways with the EU's approach. So I thought it'd be interesting to, to touch on that. And then in the third part, as I mentioned, I'll touch on the role of standards. And I will also, towards the end, tell you a bit about an initiative that I'm co-leading um, dedicated to AI standards. Um, it's called the AI Standards Hub, um, initiative that we've launched one and a half years ago that uh, might be of interest, so we'll come to that towards the very end. Um, but I know it's been a, a long day already, so I wanted to briefly start with a couple of questions to get a sense in the room, um, and maybe to lighten it up a little. Um, who has heard of the AI Act before, the EU AI Act? Maybe a brief show, show of hands. Okay, that's great, quite a few people. Um, how many of you, who knows how many principles there are in the UK government's approach to AI regulation? <laughs> What's that? Did you have that? Lots. Lots. Well, actually, the good news is not too many. It's only five, so they can be counted on one hand. <laughs> um, and then lastly, one last question. Who has heard of Senelec JTC21? Okay, good. Well, we'll come to that. Um, obviously, as you might assume, that's a, a, the standards committee uh, for AI in Senelec. So we'll come to that towards the end. But it sounds like there is hopefully going to be something interesting and new for everyone um, in what I'll share. Um, now, before I jump into the EU uh, landscape, a couple of quick words of scene setting just to clarify the scope of what I'll be talking about. So I'll be focusing specifically on you know, new regulatory initiatives that are pursued by central governments um, and is, are focused on regulating AI. It's an important point to to make, to emphasize, because there's, of course, lots of existing, uh, you know, regulatory um, requirements and legal frameworks that have implications for AI, but that weren't designed for AI. And so there's, it's not a vacuum, as it were, you know, where, you know, all of a sudden we, you know, AI is unregulated and, and governments think of putting in place rules. There is a lot of, you know, applicable 
uh, law and regulation in the background. For example, equality regulation, um, data protection regulation. Um, and uh, so this is just to say, you know, in what, I, what follows, I'll focus on the EU AI Act as a piece, a new, you know, AI focused piece of legislation and then the UK government's uh, approach as in terms of the central government's approach, thinking about what, what, what new forms of regulatory requirements may be needed for AI, but that's not to suggest that there's a vacuum, you know, and it's important to, to note at the beginning that, um, you know, the examples that I just mentioned, equality law, data protection law, um, also the Online Safety Act in the UK or the Digital Services Act at the EU level, um, you know, different regulatory frameworks that are meant to apply to online platforms, they all have implications uh, for, for how AI is used in different contexts. Now with that said, um, let's look at the EU AI Act. Now the EU AI Act is uh, an important case to consider because it's the world's first attempt um, to put in place a new piece of regulation that is meant to be comprehensive in addressing AI as a technology. So it's, it's also what we sometimes refer to as a horizontal regulatory framework or a cross-sectoral framework. It's meant to set out regulatory requirements for AI across the board regardless of where AI uh, is being used. So it's, it's very ambitious in that. It's, it's meant to um, you know, set these rules in place and at the same time you know, in a sense, have the final, provide the final word on how the EU will regulate. So it's, it's meant to provide the certainty that that's the regulation and there won't be, you know, ever more regulation uh, going to be added. That's why it's a, it's a comprehensive uh, framework. Um, now, why is this important? Uh, you know, from an international perspective, um, it's a first mover, you know, um, initiative in, in, in the sense that I just described. Um, there are stringent uh, requirements in the AI Act, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, and those apply to anyone, any, any company seeking to uh, develop AI or deploy AI uh, for or in the European uh, market, single market. So it, uh, that includes companies that may not be situated in the EU, but companies that uh, you know, seek to do business in the EU market or whose services affect EU citizens. Um, so that's, you know, that's that stringent scope and the broad scope uh, make it significant. But then as a last point really to note, and that really can't be underestimated, is what uh, often referred to in policy circles as the Brussels effect. And we've seen this with the um, data protection regulation that the EU put in place, where the idea is that uh, because of the size of the EU market, it is likely to have an effect for internationally operating companies to adopt the requirements and roll them out, adhere to them, you know, in their um, operations around the world, rather than having a bespoke approach, you know, to their operations in the EU as opposed to other areas. And so in many ways, this Brussels effect is the idea that it will, you know, set the standard, um, as it were, set a threshold that will be followed, um, you know, more broadly, not just, not just by companies that fall within the scope of the regulation. Now, I, I'll try to just give you a high-level overview so of the, the key features of the AI Act. Um, and the main feature is that it's a risk-based approach. So while it's meant to cover all forms of AI, it doesn't treat all forms of AI equal. That's really important. Um, and in fact, there's a large area of the use of AI that, that where the Act basically says there won't be regulatory requirements for those uses of AI. So you see at the bottom of the pyramid, there is the, the green area. Um, those are um, what are considered minimal risk systems, and those are essentially unregulated. Right? But it, it's part of the regulation to say that those are unregulated. Um, so examples for those would be um, you know, spam filters. Um, as an example, you know, where, where, where people will often, often say that's the case where AI obviously doesn't have the potential to you know, cause severe harm um, and, and therefore you know, the, the, it's okay to take a more hands-off approach from a regulatory perspective. And there are many more of those, of those areas. Um, at the top of the pyramid, there is uh, what are considered unacceptable risk um, uses of AI. Um, 
I'm not going to go into detail. We can come back to that during the discussion if it's of interest. Um, but it's a range of different forms of using AI, for example, certain forms of biometrics or live facial recognition in law enforcement under certain conditions, variety, uh, social scoring, variety of uses where the regulation simply says those are prohibited. Now, the interesting bit, and the, you know, where the bit, in a sense, where all the attention is, is the layer below, um, what the Act refers to as high-risk systems. And so those are systems that fall into um, any one of a number of categories of use cases that are set out in the regulation. And those use cases are subject to um, a, a whole set of um, stringent requirements. And I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about those in a moment. There's a yellow layer um, that, that I think we can neglect for the for what follows, um, because it's, it's a relatively light touch. Um, it's an area um, that includes users of AI um, in, the in, in the context of customer-facing chatbots, for example, or um, generators of deep fake um, content, um, where the regulation has a transpa transparency requirement and essentially says users and you know, consumers need to be told that they interact with an AI system. It needs to be clear to them that they're interacting with AI, but that's about all that the regulation says there. So the orange bit is the, is the bit that, you know, where the action is, as it were. In addition, though, there is also the foundational provision, the foundational layer in this pyramid um, for what the regulation refers to as general purpose AI models. Um, so that's more or less you know, what people nowadays have become to refer to as foundation models, um, uh, different forms of large language models. And that was an area that was really contentious in the final stages of the negotiations of the AI Act. But um, the agreement that's been reached now includes a significant range of provisions that are also stringent for um, general purpose AI model developers uh, and users. And so, um, to sum it up, you know, the, as I mentioned, I think the, the prohibited systems are an easy case to deal with for the purpose of the presentation because they're simply prohibited. Um, the limited risk systems, as I said, have you know, nothing but this transparency obligation that I just mentioned, so that's easy to explain. And then low risk basically means it's, uh, it's unregulated. So the two areas, I think, of interest really um, are the uh, high risk systems and the, um, you know, the, the provisions that apply to general purpose AI models. Um, in terms of the high risk users, to give you a flavor of um, you know, the kinds of use cases that fall in, into those categories, um, that's a simplified list. So those, those are the eight categories that the AI Act defines in an annex, and it then includes a, a bit of sort of descriptive language around each category and some examples of more specific use cases that fall in each category. So there is a bit more clarification in, in the, in the con content of the regulation about what each, what each category means or what it includes. Having said that, um, one of the you know, recurring points of criticism of the AI Act is that there is a lot of um, vagueness even with those added um, explanations. So it's anything but clear that you know, um, it will be easy and straightforward to interpret whether a given case, that there's probably gonna be a, quite a lot of legal disagreement once the act enters into force around certain use cases in terms of whether they fall into one of those categories or don't fall into them. But in terms of you know, giving you a high level flavor, um, so different forms of biometrics, um, certain forms of biometrics are banned and are in the prohibited category, but those that aren't banned you know, they, they are considered uh, high-risk users. Um, so, you know, non-live forms of facial recognition, for example, um, and, and, and related um, applications. The use of AI in critical infrastructure, um, uses of AI in education and vocational training, um, employment, worker management, access to self-employment, so all kinds of AI uses um, where, you know, algorithms might be used to make decisions about um, the management of workers, about hiring decisions, CV screening would be an example, because that's widely used nowadays. 
um, in HR divisions, uh, that would fall into, the, into that category. Access to and enjoyment of essential private services and essential public services and benefits, that would include decision making, AI enabled decision making in the context of healthcare access, for example. Um, but it also includes, and that's sort of hidden behind that language, um, things like credit scoring in the context of financial services, where access to loans is considered um, an essential private service and therefore you know, using an automated AI system to make decisions about um, loan eligibility would be considered high risk. Um, law enforcement, um, that won't be surprising um, that that's considered high risk. Users of AI in migration, asylum, border control management, and all kinds of uses of AI in the context of justice and democratic processes. So those are the, those are the high level you know, categories. Now, very important, as I've already mentioned, those aren't, you know, the fact that they're considered high risk doesn't mean that they're prohibited. Um, to the contrary, I mean, the, the, the AI Act is meant to enable the responsible use of AI in those contexts, but in order to ensure that the risks associated with those uses are managed appropriately, um, the AI Act sets out what are known as essential requirements. I hope that's, yeah, it's trans legible. legible enough. The, the, some of the colors have changed, by the way. The, uh, you might wonder why low risk is purple as a flow risk. That ma was meant to be a green uh, box um, in terms of, you know, sort of a traffic light system. Um, but yeah, so this slide sets out, you know, the essential requirements that apply to high risk systems. Um, they include things like data, you know, ensuring appropriate data governance processes, data quality related aspects, technical documentation, record keeping, transparency in the provision of information about a system, human oversight, accuracy, robustness, cybersecurity, and then having in place a overarching risk management system um, when it comes to those kinds of systems. Now, um, Again, it would go beyond sort of what, I can, what can be done in an in a overview presentation to you know, go into detail on each of those requirements. Um, but I hope this gives you a flavor of the kinds of things that the AI Act you know, expects and then provide, provides a segue into the discussion on standards later on. Um, just as a, a short preview, I'll come back to this later. The connection to standards in the context of the AI Act is that the European Commission explicitly designed the AI Act such that um, standards, and not just any standards, but um, what are known as harmonized standards in the European context, the standards developed by Sven Fenelec in this case, are meant to support uh, the implementation of the AI Act and are meant to detail how these requirements that are set out in the Act, those um, seven essential requirements, how they are meant to be understood in practice. And so um, in light of that, the European Commission has issued a standardization request, as the Commission tends to do, for product safety regulation uh, to send Senelec to develop standards that will elaborate on these uh, seven requirements. But I'll come back, I'll come back to that um, later um, and, and the role of standards. So I think that, um, yeah, that sort of sums up my quick overview introduction to the AI Act. Um, to conclude, just a quick word on sort of timelines. Um, those of you who have followed the debate will be aware that the Act is basically, you know, has been agreed now in its final form. Um, and uh, we are now awaiting the different sort of the, the phased um, implementation of the Act. Um, that will start with the prohibited um, applications of AI that will come into force um, in six months' time. The provisions for general purpose AI models will come into force in 12 months, and then in two years' time is when the uh, high-risk um, AI systems will be subject to the essential requirements um, that I just set out. So I hope that um, you know, that was digestible. I realized there was a lot of information, um, but that's, that sums up what I um, wanted to say about the AI Act. And I'll now 
switch over to just say a few words in a bit less detail about um, the UK government's approach on AI regulation. Um, to begin with, to mention that that, you know, like the AI Act, that's an approach that has been in the works for quite a while. So the AI Act has been under negotiation for, you know, over two years. Um, the UK government's policy thinking goes back um, several years um, to 2021, forms part of sort of the wider government's thinking on digital uh, regulation more broadly, not just AI. Um, and then went through a sequence of different policy um, papers, white papers, um, that sort of step-by-step step, um, develop the approach. And the approach is now encapsulated in the white paper that was published um, last year, which is on the slide here in March last year, uh, just called a pro-innovation approach to AI regulation. And uh, that white paper was followed by a consultation that came to an end earlier um, uh, this year. And the government published a response to the consultation um, a couple of months ago, which basically confirmed the, um, the approach set out in the white paper. So the white paper is more or less um, what will be pursued. Now, the white paper sets out an approach that is described and framed as a risk-based approach, which, of course, you, you know, may make you think, hold on, isn't that also a feature of the AI Act? And it is, of course, after the AI Act has these different risk tiers. Um, and the UK government has also emphasized the, the obvious point that AI you know, related um, regulatory considerations should depend on the risk profile of different use cases. Um, it is in practice quite different in the sense that um, while the EU AI Act defines through this list of use case categories that I just mentioned, um, defines ex ante what kinds of uses of AI are considered to be high risk, low risk and so on, um, the AI regulation white paper doesn't do that. And the, uh, instead, basically, simply sets out a principle to say, you know, regulatory requirements should depend on, on the risk associated with different uses of AI, and then puts the uh, ball in the court of existing regulatory bodies to decide what action should be taken and what, what regulatory requirements should be introduced in their regulatory remits. So examples of you know, those regulatory bodies would be the data protection regulator, the um, equality law regulator, the Equality Human Rights Commission, the financial services regulator, the competition regulator, and so on and so forth. Um, I mentioned earlier, I, I, one of the icebreaker questions was the question about the, the principles in the white paper approach. And that's you know, the one thing that the white paper sets out as an overarching uh, piece of guidance um, those five principles, they will look you know, and quite familiar to anyone who's followed the AI governance space for a while. They're quite closely reflective of the principles that the OECD, for example, has published on responsible AI. And of course, they resonate you know, in many ways with some of the topics that were reflected in the essential requirements that you saw earlier, which also touched on transparency and safety and robustness and so on. But the, the white paper approach in the UK is basically limited to setting out these principles, provides a bit more language around each principle, which we don't need to go into detail now, um, and then uh, tasks existing regulators to think through the implications of those principles in their sector and decide for themselves what kind of regulatory measures, uh, what, what kind of regulatory action should be taken um, and whether or not to introduce new regulatory requirements in their particular regulatory remit. So the financial services co you know, regulator might interpret fairness in a different way compared to data protection regulator, for example. And indeed, one may decide that you know, there's a need to introduce new rules in their sector, and another regulator may decide that existing uh, provisions are sufficient to ensure that that principle is being followed. So that sums up, in a nutshell, the UK approach. Um, as I said, it's, you know, it's, uh, in a sense, because it's light touch and you know, uh, it, it sort of puts the ball in the court of regulators, it's easier to sum up because there isn't that much, uh, that much to, to summarize. Um, and time will tell, of course. Um, so we're still at an early stage you know, in basically seeing what the next steps are in pursuing the white paper approach. 
um, time will tell what action different regulatory bodies in the UK will take um, in terms of implementing those five principles. But that's too early to say at the moment. Um, there hasn't been any significant action on, any, on, a, on the part of any regulatory bodies. All right, so that was the EU approach, the EU AI Act, um, the UK government's approach. And I'll now um, move on to the role of standards and say, say a few words about, about that. Um, to, to begin with, um, to simply set out the landscape, I've captured on this slide the standards development organizations at the international level and also at the European level that um, so far are most prominent in terms of the amount of activity of AI-related standards development projects. Um, at the national level, that's DSI, that's the British standards um, body, you know, just, just as an example. Um, but uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the structure of you know, the organizations on the um, left side of the slide, ISO IEC as organizations that work together in the area of you know, uh, technologies such as AI and form a joint committee. The same for SEN Senelec at the European level. And then you know, the, the agreements that exist between ISO IEC and SEN Senelec uh, to ensure that standards developed in those organizations at the international level, the regional level, are consistent and coherent and the fact that they all rely on national standards bodies as the representative voice of individual countries. Um, so that's a fairly tightly connected set of organizations on the, on the left-hand side. And then some of the other organizations, of course, have their own membership structure, their own way of participating, um, notably here Etsy at the European level, and then IEEE, um, which is, of course, based on individual membership, um, or organizational membership, membership um, and the ITU, which is largely um, government-driven. So those are the organizations. It's by, by no means a full picture. Um, so and we, I'm sure we'll hear about some other examples in the discussion later. Um, but in terms of you know, the quantity of standards, the number of projects that are being pursued, um, those are the most prominent ones um, in terms of the AI space so far. Um, and another, this, is, this slide is another way to, to capture that. Um, so here I've, we haven't broken down you know, who is developing which standard. But this is a snapshot to simply illustrate just how vast the landscape for AI standardization at the international level already is today. Um, so you can see there are over 200 standards that are focused on AI. They're basically, you know, standards that have AI or machine learning or related term in the title of the standard, rather than being a supporting standard, such as a, a data-related standard. Um, and a, a large number of them, almost 150, already published, and a uh, you know, significant number of standards in the pipeline. Um, interesting uh, also to track to what extent standards are horizontal um, versus vertical. So horizontal standards are, of course, those that are meant to apply, like the EU AI Act, to AI applications across the board, across different sectors, and vertical standards might be standards that uh, are designed to apply to the use of AI in a particular sector, or more narrowly, the use of AI in, in a particular use case application. When it comes to horizontal standards, there is one standard that's uh, attracted particularly large amount of attention recently, so I thought I'd briefly talk about that, uh, which is ISO IEC 42001, which is a management system standard for AI uh, that was published late last year. Um, again, I assume most of you are familiar with management system standards. Um, in the ISO context, a comparison would be 27,001 for um, information security, and so 42,001 is essentially trying to achieve a similar objective in terms of an umbrella standard um, for AI. Um, and then it's designed in a way for more topic-specific standards to slot in um, and to support the implementation of that, that wide standard. So that's the, that's the existing landscape, and the, the main message here is simply you know, to point out just how much activity there is already to develop AI-related standards. 
Um, and now I wanted to briefly come back to the role of standards in the EU AI Act um, and go into a bit more detail on that. So I mentioned earlier that um, the AI Act follows the EU's established approach to product safety regulation, also known as the new legislative framework. And that framework makes you know, explicit use of standards as an implementation tool of regulatory requirements. The way that works in practice, as I mentioned earlier, is for the European Commission, whenever a new piece of product safety regulation is uh, passed, um, for the Commission to issue a request to any of the three European standards organizations, Sen Senelec and Etsy, um, to develop standards in support of the regulatory requirements. Once those standards are developed, the European Commission then considers them, and if they're considered adequate, they are adopted as what are known as harmonized standards, and they apply across the entire um, uh, internal market of the European Union. Um, and in the case of AI, the standards for the AI Act, um, and that's the acronym I mentioned earlier, um, the request has gone to SEN Senelec. There's a joint committee between SEN and Senelec that's Joint Technical Committee 21, and that's the committee that's developing the standards for the, for the AI Act. Now, it's important to emphasize that um, harmonized standards as, as defined you know, in EU uh, regulation are voluntary, so there's no regulatory requirement to use standards. In other words, um, anyone who is subject to the regulation is free to find a way of showing compliance with the regulation. But in practice, most organizations, almost all organizations, will use standards as a way of showing compliance. And the reason for that is that there's this concept of a legal presumption of conformity that um, is implied by the recognition of those standards as harmonized standards. So essentially, what the European Commission is saying when a standard is adopted as a harmonized standard is to say if you if you comply to the standard we consider that you've met the regulatory requirements so it's, it's sort of a, a rule for how to you know how to interpret the regulation now there is you know the second alternative on the slide you know that's open to organizations to basically come up with their own explanation um, to show how they have complied with the regulation but that's of course a lot of work um, and the burden of proof is on the organization that needs to make the case. Whereas if you rely on a harmonized standard, the burden of proof, that's the whole point of the legal presumption of conformity, is on anyone who wants to challenge um, what you have done. So there's a very strong incentive to use harmonized standards to demonstrate compliance. Um, and that's, you know, there's a long history for that in EU product safety regulation. Essentially, any, whenever you see the CE mark, there's a you know harmonized standard um, underlying that, um, and there will be the CE mark for for AI, and so that will operate in the same way. So this is a, a recap slide. I think I, I won't go into too much detail, uh, just to sort of you know highlight that there is an interesting parallel between the EU and the UK in the role of standards. You know, in recognizing standards as an important implementation tool. Um, for regulatory objectives. The AI Act has this concept of harmonized standards, and then um, in the UK white paper, as I mentioned earlier, um, there is sort of the task for regulators to interpret these five principles um, that I mentioned, and regulators are explicitly encouraged to use standards as a tool to um, issue guidance and explain how those principles are meant to be interpreted. So basically, the, you know, the, the expectation is, is that regulators take a look at the, the landscape of standards that I showed earlier, and in so far as possible, rather than coming up with their own um, specifications and pieces of guidance, try to refer to those standards in, in terms of providing guidance. Um, I won't go into detail on this either, but just to recap on the high-risk AI systems as a category in the AI Act, as I mentioned, there are seven essential requirements, and the Commission has issued a standardization request in support of those. So since Senelec, JTC21, has started to work on these 10 standards deliverables, um, 
they, they could, they, it's unclear so far, that it might be that those will be 10 standards, but it could also be that they're broken down further into you know, a, a larger number of standards. Um, and then there's a, an additional expectation that given that the AI Act in its final form now includes these provision for general purpose AI models, the commission will issue an additional request um, for the development of standards in support of the requirements that apply to those general purpose AI models. So, um, how are we doing on time? We're approaching the end, I think. So, I will, I have a couple of questions or points for discussion. I'll save those for the panel discussion. Um, and just very briefly conclude with telling you in two minutes um, about the AI Standards Hub as an initiative. So, the AI Standards Hub was set up uh, one and a half years ago um, here in the UK, but it's very much an initiative that's you know, internationally oriented and we're going through a phase where we're thinking very strongly about how we can collaborate across borders um, in partnering with, you know, organizations that pursue similar objectives. The, the core of the motivation for setting up the hub was the fact that, as you saw in this earlier slide on the snapshot, the standards landscape for AI is quite rapidly evolving and it's already quite complex and so it can be really difficult for stakeholders to identify what are the most relevant standards projects that are underway, um, what are the ways to get involved, um, and then of course make use of standards once they have been published. And so there's an important mission of the hub in particular around supporting stakeholders in becoming more actively involved and navigating uh, this complex landscape. We've got four pillars of activity. Um, there are uh, broadly speaking around what we call the observatory. So we build a database on our website that tracks which uh, standards um, are under development, which standards have been published. There are also ways of uh, interacting with community members and discussing the content of standards. Um, in so far as you've experience, made experience with, with individual standards. There's a pillar around community and collaboration to identify needs, think about how needs can be addressed. Knowledge and training, that pillar is dedicated to uh, capacity building, especially for stakeholders who have less experience with standardization in terms of understanding how the process works, how to get in involved. And then research and analysis is where we um, try to provide sort of strategic guidance to standardization efforts by identifying gaps trends, needs, and so on. We are very much multi-stakeholder in our orientation, um, and so we try to work with and support all of these groups that are on the slide. Um, and we've built our online platform, so if you haven't come across it before, um, a warm invitation to take a look at that. Um, it also includes the database that I just mentioned that tracks um, the development of related uh, of AI related standards um, and then there are various other ways to stay in touch and take a look um, so um, yeah um, feel free to follow us on social media we have got a, a newsletter that comes out every um, every month or so and we have quite a wide range of events um, that are also announced on our website um, that might be of interest so I'll stop here thank you <laughs>